Hello and welcome fellow motorsports fans. My name is Marcel and I'm once again here to talk about an absolutely packed week and full of junior racing. We've had the mad amount of 16 races in total, although only 15 of those were actually streamed. We will talk about this in a second. And there have been highlights throughout really. We had the beginning of the new Formula Winter series. We had Dorian Parr finally scoring her second ever win, which is the big story really. And lots and lots of other news. As I said, 16 races to cover, so let's not waste any more time. We begin with the Saudi F4 series, as I think it is probably the least interesting one or the weakest one, but we still had a few interesting storylines to cover. My biggest one, probably uh, Andrei Petrovic. I talked about him last weekend already. He did impress me in his rookie weekend, but he won up to this time out and actually scored his maiden victory in only his second ever F4 race weekend. So I thought that was pretty nice to watch. And we had the local boys also performing really well. That was kind of nice to see. Obviously, with a an F4 series with sort of this mixed audience of local drivers and some Europeans, you would assume the European boys to be dominant. And in fact, they are not really. Like, there is some talent there, certainly from the region as well. Most notably, a winner in the third race, I want to say, Almar Shergi. And then there was Alreyani did quite well. I hope I am not butchering these names completely. I probably am. But so yeah, there is definitely also local talent to keep an eye on. Unfortunately though, I do need to say the main thing about this series for me really is the, the lack of quality every now and then. As a not broadcast for once, but the actual driving standards have been a bit lackluster. It is very chaos and carnage heavy throughout, so it feels a bit difficult to take some of the results all too seriously. And then throw in like reverse good races and all sorts. So it is. It is a bit of a hectic series and one that's kind of hard to actually fully rank, if that makes sense. Nonetheless, it does provide an entertaining on-track product and gives an opportunity to drivers like Petrovic and Kutzkov to get their debuts out of the way. So that's good, I suppose. Anyway, let's move on to some more competitive fields. We stay in the region, but we move on to the big one, the F4 UAE Championship, the big winter series for all aspiring F4 talent moving towards F1 in the future. And as I said already, the big headline news is Dorian Pan got her second ever F4 victory in race two of the F4 UAE this time out. She actually put it on pole as well. That is quite a crucial point. Not, you know, that is a, a rare one to do for female drivers in F4 championships. And uh, so we have to talk about the context of this win because I I said in the, the first one she got, I said it's not super meaningful. Obviously, it's a great storyline in and of itself, but it was a weak grid. It was a reverse grid, even if I remember correctly. She was only fighting weaker drivers for the win. So, you know, it looks good in the CV, but that's about where it stops. This one, though, yes, there's a caveat to it, which is she only got promoted to the actual win after the fact when Ki Nakamura Berta got demoted post-race for I want to say jumping the start it was it wasn't the incident I was a bit confused when I came out either way he got a post race five second penalty that gave Pan the win so now you could argue oh it means even less because she didn't even win on track but um, I would argue quite the opposite uh, first of all obviously the field is infinitely more competitive so she is going up against yes Ki Nakamura Berto who technically was present at the F4 Southeast Asia as well but this entire grid is stacked top to bottom, so there's no comparison there, if you ask me. And then the crucial bit is she actually, she put it on pole and she was fighting for the win and she could have maybe even won it on track. She didn't quite, but she was. Nakamura Berta didn't run away with it by any stretch of the imagination. She was right behind them the entire race, sort of stalking her prey, you know. So it's, um, she was very close to winning on track anyway, is the point, I suppose. Now... Dorian Pan win aside, which we all know and love, there is a championship still uh, being fought over, which if you remember last week, it is actually the closest of the championships running at the moment. And it was a bit of a shocking weekend because all the favorites had just weird results all around. So we have obviously the big two protagonists are Freddie Slater and Keanu Alazari. They managed to take each other out at the beginning of race two. That was already a very, very good start. In general, Slater, after starting so, so consistently into it, barely scored any points this weekend if he even yeah i think slater didn't score at all and keanu alazari only scored like a handful of points so it's really 
it's bizarre. He now leads the championship by 13 points, but this means that all the other competitors that were all, already like half out of it are now straight back into the fight. Ki Nakamura Berta being the most prominent ones of those, but then obviously he also bottled his own chances at actually now taking the lead of the championship by getting penalties and stuff like this. So again, just a really, just a weird run and sort of set back everyone. This time out, we just had a very different look at the sharp end of the grid, really. You know, one of the prom prominent stories for me was high tech this time actually showed up in full force, everybody fighting at the sharp end. So I don't even know what I'm more excited about. We had uh, Stilp got his first win. That's really nice. Um, we had Fairclough actually showed up again this time and could do some stuff and wasn't just fighting around P20, which is great to see. I think he will be one of the favorites for the British F4. So he, you know, <laughs> needs to find his form. And we had Siwurthen scoring his first points, finally, after threatening to do so in the past couple of weekends. I am kind of like low-key excited about the guy, so that was nice to see. And then this aside, just a bizarre one, which you probably noticed anyway, but we had a wet race at Yas Marina um, in both the F4, but like the entire weekend was a bit wet all around. It was really weird to see. We also had a wet... Uh, well, I guess we have a wet week now currently with the F3 tests in Bahrain. So what's going on in the desert? I don't know, but we're not here to talk about the climate, are we? So instead, let's go to the Formula Winter Series. If you enjoy these sorts of recaps of race weeks gone by, then make sure you are subscribed to the channel so you won't miss any future iterations. And if you want to help me out a little, you can always leave a like on the videos. I would really appreciate it. Now, let's move on to the new Winter Series on the block, the Formula Winter Series. This one is incredibly exciting because it does feature a very different lineup from the other two. This is very, very rookie heavy for F4 terms. And obviously, as you maybe expect from just the geographical nature of it, this is mainly filled with people that will compete in the Spanish F4, but also some Italian boys, for example, from US Racing. The big teams in this is, is MP Motorsports and Campos, so the two big dogs in the Spanish F4, and then US Racing from Italy. These are sort of the, the three big teams in this series. Now, there is way too many names to realistically cover. I will try to feature different drivers in the coming weeks to sort of give everyone a fair chance in the spotlight. But for now, let's try to highlight the important ones. For the first two races in particular, I might want to add it's been a very tricky weekend in terms of conditions. For the first couple races, we had the same podium constellation, albeit in different orders, with returning drivers Cardenas and Peebles uh, competing for the top spots, and Gladish, who was in contention for Ferrari Academy seat and is one of the most promising rookies, or at the very least, he was the most promising rookie this race weekend, no doubt in my mind. Now, as I said, these three shared the podium in the first two races in different orders. In the third race, it was Coda taking the win, lights to flag more or less uncontested, but the um, the sort of like the top 10 constellation remained somewhat similar. We had the same protagonists showing up in all of them. So there's Akshay Boro, who you'd absolutely expect as a returning driver to show up. Same with Gotzi and Ferrara, but also Mikkel Garde Pedersen, I want to say. I call him MGP in my mind, the Danish F4 champion, who only now turned 15, I believe he's also there. He's been going really well, actually. I want to point him out as one of the best charges through the pack. He seemed to quality a little out of position and always made his way up the order. It's been quite nice to watch. And then in the rookie category, and as I said, lots and lots and lots of interesting rookies. So this will just be a quick listing of a few big one so there's Konagi who did really well in the first couple of races in particular scored a few points already then there is French karting champion uh, Weisenberger Weisenberger I, I don't speak French it's probably pronounced entirely differently it reads like a German name and my brain can't handle it so that's why um, then there's Lucas Flusher the third guy in the Flusher family or the, the second guy to make his F4 debut now he's actually looking really good and I would say he's the most promising of the of the Flushers in my mind then we've got a German talent with Maxim Rehm and a Belgian guy, Strauven, who I think he's already here. Yeah, he's debuted last year anyway, so you, you might be familiar with him. But all of these did really well in the rookie category. Now, if people do well, they have to be losers on the opposite side of the spectrum. And I want to highlight one particular one, which is René Lamas. And I've talked about René a fair bit going into this season. Um, in my opinion, he is one of the 
top top talents graduating to car yeah graduating from cards to f4 this year i've even made a video about it you can check it out up here but um yeah so this was very disappointing actually now to be fair he did quali poorly so naturally it was just very hard to recover over this one weekend by no means do i think um this means he's overrated or anything i'm sure he will bounce back in no time but it is fair to at least highlight it now the last point for this series is the female participation which is actually quite high obviously it's not just dorian pan there are other female f4 drivers currently warming up for f1 academy but I have to say the contrast between this trio here and Pa over in F4 UAE couldn't couldn't be any higher, unfortunately. Now there's Bianca Bastamanti and Kerry Schreiner, who unfortunately both of them not super promising. Schreiner obviously way too old for this kind of series anyway. And Bastamanti, you know, she's got the social media presence and she is young enough. There's some potential there, but on this level, she's just not cutting it. And I don't think she ever will unfortunately so this has been a little rough to watch and then uh, last but not least Leah Block is also participating but obviously she does get a bit of a pass it's her first time in open wheelers so fair enough she didn't do anything but neither was she expected to so that's entirely fine now we will wait and see how this develops but I really hope at least one of them shows up and scores some points along the way or something otherwise this will look really really bad in contrast in particular now then, let's move on to the faster machinery. On to the Formula Regional Middle Eastern Championship. And as I've slightly teased earlier, there's been a problem with this series this time out, which is uh, race one was unfortunately not streamed at all. They tried, they didn't forget about it, but it, whatever, technical difficulties, it did not work. But I, it's it's a bit of a theme. I don't like bad broadcasts, okay? So we need we need to sort this out for the future. Anyway, I believe Tarpanen won this one, if I remember correctly. The, the story of the weekend in general is Tarpanen continues to be the man to beat. This is very much a theme now in this series. He's been absolutely stunning all season long. And Taylor Barnard, his main champion rival, has actually elected to stay for the title fight despite the F3 preseason tests more or less going on simultaneously. So he's sort of bouncing around. Well, the race is finished on Saturday, the test started on Sunday, so he did have a chance to do both. But yeah, it must be a very busy weekend for poor Taylor Barnard. Nonetheless, it almost felt a bit pointless because his weekend wasn't all that hot in the Formula Regional Middle Eastern Championship. And so Tarpanen is pretty damn clear now in terms of the championship unfortunately for Barnard nonetheless I mean really the only thing to talk about in this series now is how exciting Tarpanen is at the moment he is delivering all the things we had sort of hoped for last year and then he to be fair he did kind of show it in the Middle East not quite to this, ex this extent but he, he performed really well in the winter and then dropped off a bit during the summer I really hope it doesn't repeat itself here because he looks way too good for that now just a couple other things to highlight here. Uh, first of all, Zachary David, Tappanen's teammate actually, so the RSGP uh, certainly helped him a lot, but he has been looking better again this week and he's been sort of hit or miss. He's had a few good ones, a few bad ones. This is firmly in the good category, scoring good, good points every race. So just a quick shout out to Zachary David. And then last but not least, a bit of a heartbreak story, which is Bruno Del Pino. I believe it would have been his first win on this sort of level, definitely in a competitive grid like this. Um, he was leading the reverse grid race for all of it, headed on pole there, I think. Anyway, he didn't have any competition in this race. And then his car just sort of died on him. Um, suspension failure it was, if I remember. Yeah, he got he got smashed into a wall. It'll pop up on your screen here. Um, his just front left suspension just broke randomly over a curb and that was that. So, um, heartbreak story, it happens in motorsports, obviously mechanical failure is, is part of it, but man, that was tough to watch. And it gave another kind of odd feeling win to Rafa Kamara, who is now a firmly P3 in a championship since Stenson is gone, but he does not feel like a P3 in the championship, I'll tell you that for free. Um, I'm sure we will talk more about Rafa Kamara in the future, but for now, let's go to the Formula Regional Oceania last. 
our last stop for the week once again takes us to New Zealand, where once again Roman Bilinski continues to comfortably lead the championship. Um, although this weekend it's not been as dominant as it has been in the past couple, he actually lost two of the three races this time. Um, he did win the first one in dominant fashion, as you sort of as you'd expect. Um, the last one he actually got robbed off the line by Skeets, which means he actually got to score his first win on this level. That's great for the local guy, but nonetheless. This championship is really all about, first of all, Bilinski, and then second of all, everybody's ability to just constantly drive in the rain. I think I said it last week, but everybody coming out of this championship alive will be a rain master in Europe because every single session appears to be wet in New Zealand for some reason. So that's been a very interesting development. Um, then we had a maiden victory for Michael Shin. That was quite nice to watch. Obviously, yes, it was a reverse grid race, not super duper meaningful, but he did um, first of all, muscle his way past Woodstock on the start. That was pretty nice to watch. Um, actually, getting getting his elbows out properly. I don't even know if he got penalised or not, but he did go out of his way to build a gap big enough so that a penalty wouldn't have mattered anyway. That's why I didn't keep track of this story. Um, I believe was it Gerard G who got P2 or P3. Either way, he massively gapped Gerard G in this one as well. I do remember that. Now, Patrick Woodstock is really the last storyline we got to talk about in this series and i do bring him up every week obviously reigning f4 usa champion but this guy really continues to develop at a rapid pace he has started more or less on par with titus sherlock in particular but also his other kiwi racing boys but he has developed at such a rate that he's gone from you know running around p10 to now fighting for podiums more or less every race and if this develop continues on to next week, I wouldn't be surprised if he actually ends up stealing one of the last three race wins on the table as well. So definitely, definitely keep an eye out on Patrick Woodstock. So yeah, anyway, now it's your time to get to work. Go type in the comments, go tell me all the things that interested you the most of this weekend. Was it Dory Parr getting a first win? Was it one of the many amazing rookies in the Formula Winter Series? Or was it something else entirely? That's up to you. I want to know about it. This is the entire point of this channel and the comment section in particular. Anyway, thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next week.